Welcome to episode two of Ships, Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. I'm Helen Chersky. We're going to be bringing you fabulous stories of the sea and space and history and culture, all kinds of interesting things, all from the museum's collections and also special guests who are going to join us with their expertise. If there's a question you would like answered on one of the subjects that we are going to cover, please do uh, get in contact with us. We'd love to hear from you. If you look for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you'll find us. So do send along your questions on this topic and on the topics that are coming up in future weeks. But we are going to get straight on with today's subject, which is journeys into the unknown. Humans as a species are a curious bunch in many ways, but we like going out and exploring. We like seeing what's beyond the edge of what we know. And so, and the thing about that is that we've been doing it for millennia, for centuries. There's all these stories of humans having done this before. So we're going to explore, we're going to look back now at the history of, and the history and the present of extreme environments. What is it like to explore those places? What are the problems? What are the human things that keep coming up, whether you're in the seventh century uh, or the 17th century or whether it's right now and to help us with all of this we've got two fabulous curators from the museum and a proper deep sea expert so I would like to introduce Greg Brown who is a Royal Observatory astronomer, uh, Robert Blythe the senior curator of world and maritime history at Royal Museums Greenwich and also John Copley who is an associate professor of ocean exploration. So just um, introduce yourselves a little bit, say a little bit about your connection to this topic, maybe we'll start with uh, John? Uh, I'm a deep sea biologist, so my research explores patterns of life in the deep ocean. And when possible, that involves getting out on expeditions aboard research ships, getting down into the deep ocean and discovering new species of deep sea animals. Uh, Robert, do you want to go next? Um, I'm the exact opposite of that. I'm an armchair explorer, so um, I just sit and read about exploration. <laughs> and dig around in the museum's collections on these things. And not last but not least, Greg. Uh, well, I'm an astronomer. I spent several years as a, a researcher, and now I spend my time uh, educating the public about all sorts of things to do with understanding space and, of course, space exploration as well, humans going out into space and learning more about it. And we're going to use space to set the scene, to get us going, uh, because this week it is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission, which became possibly the most famous Apollo mission after the one where they actually landed on the moon for all the wrong reasons. And in the end, possibly the right reason, which was that there was a happy ending. Um, so we're going to I'm going to play a clip. And so this was in 1970. It was 50 years ago. And Apollo 13 was supposed to be the third manned mission to land on the moon. But it didn't get there. There was an oxygen tank failure two days in. Um, the crew had to retreat to the lunar module and effectively use it as a lifeboat. And so what we're going to hear is a clip of Jim Lovell talking about what it was like in the lunar module as they were stuck and just traveling back to Earth. I went in there one time to go to sleep and Jack was on top of the couch and said, Jack, put up all the window shades. Uh, let's get the place nice and dark. We'll, we'll just relax and have it nice and dark in here. We can really get some sleep. And I woke up a couple hours later and I was freezing. Uh, as normally happens, putting up window shades in, in space cuts out the sunlight and normally cools down the spacecraft. But in most flights, the heat from the systems will quickly rewarm it. And as soon as we get the window shades up, you'll be in normal position again. But we got the window shades off after that and the spacecraft never did warm up again. Command module just slowly kept going down in temperature until I think uh, just prior to reentry. Uh, it was down to about 38 degrees. And along with that, it was a, a sort of a chilling uh, coldness. The walls were perspiring, the windows were completely wet, and it, uh, it wasn't too healthy. I recall that we went in there to get some hot dogs one day, and it was like reaching into the freezer for the, for the food. So it's a great clip. It's not, it doesn't exactly paint the shiny, you know, it's modern space exploration of the future thing. It paints this picture of being stuck in this tin can and it's cold and damp. <laughs> so what? And the thing that strikes me about that is that it's so, it's so, it's so much the opposite of what we imagine space exploration to be. What, what are your opinions on it? How, you know, what, what are the things you picked out of that clip? Who's going to go first? Well, strangely enough, one of the one of the weird things about spaceflight is that. Uh, 
you think of space as being extremely cold, uh, and it is. Space itself is very, very cold. But actually, one of the biggest difficulties in space exploration, and certainly in unmanned space exploration, is keeping everything cold. Because when you're in direct sunlight the entire time, it's actually really quite difficult to cool everything down. However, the issue with manned space flight is because you have this enclosed space with lots of coolant everywhere, if you do block out the sunlight from getting into the spacecraft, then everything does suddenly become very, very cold. It's not supposed to get down to 38 Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius in those places. It's supposed to be comfortable for the astronauts. And yet here there was a problem and uh, it wasn't possible to keep the spacecraft warm. And um, um, how about John? What did you pick out of that? Well, it is. We, we're familiar with the pictures of exploration, but we never get the, the other senses, the other feelings that you get from being there. So that was so nicely described there. And there are parallels with the deep ocean. Um, it's cold in the deep diving submersibles that we use to get into the deep ocean. Most of the deep ocean is two to four degrees. In some places, it's even colder. The walls similarly are usually metal for the deep diving craft and, and it's cold all the time. So you, you have to wrap up warm. Um, it can be very warm at the surface and then you kind of have both extremes to deal with in your clothing. Uh, and also he mentioned, you know, uh, having a hot dog and, and the food and all these sort of other things that we have to do when we're in these environments. Uh, it's the same for us. We're often stuffing our faces with chocolate to keep our sugar levels up and stop and have lunch. And uh, yeah, it, it's those sort of little details that, that aren't there in the pictures that have been back from these places and and how about you robert well i think it's it's interesting that when something does go wrong whether you're in deep space um down below the surface of the sea or actually on the ocean itself there's only a thin skin of whatever material it is that's protecting you from where you don't actually want to be. Um, you know, so it, it's very interesting whether it's the, the wooden hull of a ship or, or the highly pressurised systems that are going to protect you um, below the surface or out into space. So there, there is this idea of human, humans, are, we're very um, picky in a way, aren't we? We want our little bubble of life as normal and we package ourselves up in this little parcel and then it's the whole parcel that goes on these adventures well let's start we're going to go through uh, six objects we're going to start with john who whose first object is one of these little parcels do you want to tell us about your submersible john sure so these are the craft the vehicles that we have these days for getting into the deep ocean and they carry people inside them in the relative comfort that we need so uh, unlike scuba divers, whose bodies are exposed to pressure, more pressure the deeper they go, in these craft, we stay at normal atmospheric pressure. So we don't have to decompress. Um, all we need is a hull that is strong enough to withstand the pressure of the ocean outside. Uh, and we have actually had these craft for much longer than I think people realise. So we're familiar with the stories of the first astronauts and certainly the first people to walk on the moon. Um, but the deep ocean starts at 200 metres deep. So the first bathynauts, as we call them, people to get into ocean that was actually 1930 uh, in a very primitive version of one of these crafts swinging on a cable um, called the bathysphere uh, and William Beebe who was a biologist and Otis Barton who was the engineer who designed the bathysphere uh, and their colleague Gloria Hollister was the world's first female bathynaut right back back at the start as well uh, they got into the deep ocean where did they go what did they find they were dangled on a cable from a barge off Bermuda and they didn't go to the to the deep sea floor. They, they went to look at what's in the in the inner space of, of midwater. Uh, and they were the first people to see deep sea life alive, going about its business in its natural habitat with all the bioluminescence and the kind of things we, we take for granted on Blue Planet 2 and so on now. Uh, maybe, maybe just talk us through a little bit about why the deep sea is an extreme environment, because it is, you know, we think of it about as being a long way away, even though it isn't that far away in a straight line. But why is it why why is something that can be only four kilometres away an extreme environment? Well, it's only really extreme to us because we can't survive there. Uh, it's home to all the animals that live there, adapted to these conditions. And it's the reality of most of the surface of our planet. Uh, so my favourite statistic, more than half the world is covered by water that's more than two miles deep. So it's not just that it's you know an ocean planet, the blue appearance of it from space. It's actually how deep 
those oceans are, um, particularly relative to our to our human scale. Uh, so uh, the deeper we go, the more pressure there is. That's a challenge for us if we were trying to survive unprotected down there. Uh, it's dark, you know, by a thousand meters, even in the clearest ocean water, we're beyond the reach of the sun's rays. So that's most of the deep ocean uh, is below that. Uh, food generally becomes sparse, apart from some very exciting uh, oases that we find on the ocean floor. Uh, so it's it, we perceive it as being challenging. Uh, but of course, it isn't for the animals that are adapted to live there. And that's what we explore as deep sea biologists. And in terms of the technology needed to get there, what what's what's difficult about designing that? It's very noticeable that they're always cramped. You see pictures in these submersibles and people are always kind of folded up, fitting into the tiny space. Why can't you make a bigger? Uh, why can't you do this in comfort? <laughs> Well, you could if you had the budget, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Um, so you've got to make the hull out of something that's that's strong enough to withstand pressure, but light enough that you can crane your craft on and off the deck of a ship. So these days, titanium is really good for that, but titanium is very expensive. It's, it's light but strong, but it's hard to machine. Uh, so it's quite a challenge. Uh, that's an, an a sphere uh, like the early bathysphere. That's the best shape for resist resisting pressure equally from all sides. So the pressure is evenly distributed around the hull. Uh, so that uh, even though modern deep sea subs, they look a bit maybe more submarine -y or whatever at the heart of them is still a hollow metal ball. Uh, the rest of it is batteries and hydraulics and, and all the rest. But the part that carries the people is very cramped. It's typically just two meters across. Uh, and you've spent, you spent lots of time in, in these. How many dives have you made? Oh Cap. gosh, I, I, I'd have to do some adding up um, <laughs> over the years. Um, I've dived with, I can count how many different ones I've dived in because there aren't that many um, worldwide. Uh, so I worked with a US Navy sub when I was a PhD student, uh, went down to 2,200 metres in that. Uh, then I worked with a fantastic uh, sub called the Johnson Sea Link, which only goes to 1,000 metres, but that means the hull can be made out of see-through acrylic. So it's like a, a being oh, in a Johnson wow. bubble. Uh, you get an amazing view instead of these tiny portholes. Um, a Japanese sub, which took me down to five kilometres deep, uh, and and then for the filming of Blue Planet 2, um, we had a couple of these acrylic bubble thousand meter subs for that as well. The posh one. And what is it like? There's a question here about faith in technology, because as the person inside that capsule, whatever your capsule is, at that point, you are putting a lot of faith in a lot of engineers, in all the people who check the cables, who check the wiring. Do you think about that as you're on your way down and when you're sort of helpless? How how what how what's your relationship to that technology? You, you are utterly dependent on it, as you say. Um, there's a lot of faith in in procedure. So the teams that you're working with, uh, you know, there's great checklists pre-dive and everyone's going through that routine and they're they're well developed. And, the, you know, the people you're with are utterly confident uh, and that rubs off. If, if they're not worried, you're not worried. Well, let's. <laughs> I like that. I like the idea of everyone else. Like one of those kind of things where everyone sits on everyone else's lap, and um, no, everyone's sitting on someone else, so it's all right. But there's no person at the bottom of it. All. Let's let's move on. Just on the idea of trust. Let's move on to Robert's object because in it was a sort of different situation in a way. I don't I don't know whether there were checklists or not. But Robert, tell us about K1. Right. So. Um, K1 is essentially a, a copy of Harrison's H4, which um, he used precision timekeeping to resolve the longitude problem. So calculating how far east or west you were at sea. And um, K1 was taken by Captain Cook on his second voyage to the Pacific when he went out in 1772. And this allowed Cook to chart in a way that was much more accurate than he'd even managed on his, his first voyage. Because of course, on the first voyage, he suffered his Apollo 13 moment when he ran aground on the Great Barrier Reef, um, which is potentially an absolute disaster because for all intents and purposes, he's on the moon in terms of the likelihood of, of being found, being rescued. So he has to make extraordinary makeshift repairs. Now, going out again, but armed with K1 means that the charts he makes will be super accurate, which means that whoever goes back 
we should be able to avoid running aground on a reef or a shoal or whatever. So it's just this idea of beginning to plot the surface of the world with real accuracy, because the astonishing thing about the 1770s is that the visible surface of the moon was better charted than the South Pacific was. Maybe let's just take a step back to the importance of this, because we don't often think of clocks as technology. And yet at the time, this this and the Parisons clocks before it, this was such a big deal because of the problem of knowing where you are. Perhaps very briefly run us through before and after this this clock and Harrison's clocks came along. OK, so before you have um, Harrison's clocks for a simple method of calculating um, longitude, you would need to use um, an astronomical method. So you would need to take accurate observations of, of the stars and then undertake quite complex calculations to work through precisely where you were. How far north or south you were was a relatively simple matter, but east or west proved to be really quite a complicated thing to calculate. Now, that's fine, but what if it's a cloudy night and you can't take your calculation? And you might have a run of cloudy nights and you're continuing to sail. So where are you? You, you simply don't know. The other thing is, of course, that you only know where you are when you took the observation, because it takes you some time to calculate. So you're never on top precisely of where you are. Whereas with the um, accurate tables that come with the Harrison's clocks, you then begin to be able to pinpoint precisely where you are. So you can back up your method by using the time method with the astronomical method, and you've got a real sort of safety device there. So again, it's confidence in systems, it's confidence in the technology. And it must have been such a, a precious object because, you know, you have this clock, as you said, that the only way you're really ever going to know where you are, you set off for two years or three years or however long you're going for. And if you lose that clock at any point, frankly, you're stuffed. You, well, you'd be stuffed on a number of points. It's an enormously expensive object. K1 cost £400, which is a vast amount of money. So you're talking about something that's hundreds of thousands now. So you, you'd be you'd be stuffed. You don't want to come home without that. <laughs> you don't want to come home without that. The other thing is, of course, that the key part of your mission is charting. So if you lose the clock or the clock breaks down, you can't actually do your job properly. And so and did it go wrong at any point? Was it was it completely reliable? K1 proved to be really rather good and Cook called it his trusty friend, you know, and it, it was really very good. Um, Kendall, who produced the clock, continued to tinker to try and make the clocks cheaper and K2 which was cheaper than K1, proved not quite so reliable and did actually lose small amounts of time. But K1 was all right. <laughs> it was all right. It was good, <laughs> good enough to admit mean you, can, you came home and you could draw your maps. Yeah. Um, OK, so talking, talking about the reliability of technology, we are going to move on to possibly the most famous clip of something going wrong. <laughs> Here it is. Dan, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, I uh, have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Stand by. Hey, uh, we've we had a problem here. Can say again, please? Uh -huh. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Stand by, 13, we're looking at it. Okay, uh, right now, uh, Houston, the uh, voltage is, uh, is looking good. Uh, we had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. 
And as I recall, Main B was the one that uh, had had uh, a spike on it uh, once before. Greg, do you want to tell us what was happening there? Uh, you just heard a recording from Apollo 13, um, which was quite possibly one of the most successful failures in history. Uh, it was one of the Apollo missions to get to the moon. The intention to land on the moon is going to be the third time that people had landed on the surface of the moon. It was going to be one of the uh, more expansive missions as well. It was going to have a stronger focus on science because the, the technical achievement of actually landing had been completed already by Apollo 11 and 12. So it was going to expand our horizons for science more than for the technical achievement of getting to the moon. And then everything went wrong. Uh, Apollo 13 uh, started having issues before it even got off the ground because uh, one of the backup crew members actually contracted uh, rubella and inadvertently uh, infected everyone else of the prime and backup crew with it. Uh, of the crew left, all of them were immune except for the person who was going to be uh, the um, command module pilot. Uh, so he was replaced on um, two days before they took the, the mission off the ground. What you actually heard happened several days later. It was two days into the mission, uh, six or seven minutes after they'd completed a live television broadcast back to Earth. and. Uh, Ground Control had been noticing some issues with one of the measuring, uh, uh, with the measuring of one of the, the cryogenic oxygen tanks. It wasn't um, measuring things correctly. So they asked for an extra stir of this cryogenic oxygen tank. And then there was a huge bang. The uh, radio cut out for 1.5 seconds before a new, uh, before a different antenna took over everything seemed to have gone seriously very, very wrong. And this cryogenic oxygen uh, is uh, extremely important for um, the continued running of the fuel cells of the, the uh, lunar module and the command module. Uh, in this case, it was the command modules uh, cells that had, uh, had cell tanks that had ruptured. And they had two fuel tanks and a, a backup and the, the second fuel tank was now empty. That was the sound that you heard of the entire fuel tank it basically exploding into space, venting into space. And the first fuel tank was rapidly running out of oxygen. So in, almost immediately, it stopped being a case of how do we get these people to the moon and became a case of how on earth do we actually get them back alive? Um, the thing I love about that clip actually is that when he when he first says we've got a problem, ground control says uh, say that again. <laughs> you know, it's it's almost as if, you know they're they're not expecting yeah. to hear it, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. in the recording as though it takes them a few seconds to to really take on board that this isn't they've not misheard something. You know. Yeah. So uh, talking about uh, relying on other people when you're in uh, a, a space mission on the way to the moon as the Apollo missions were. Um, much of the reading of instruments happened by people in ground control, in mission control back in Houston or wherever they happened to be. And they actually, uh, one of the ground control uh, crew actually didn't think that there was a huge problem because they were looking at the, the fuel level for tank one and assuming that that meant that tank two was fine as well. Uh, it wasn't until some time later that they realized, oh, hang on, an entire fuel tank is now, uh, an entire cryogenic um, oxygen tank is now missing and this one is rapidly decreasing. And they suddenly realized how big a problem this could be. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because the, you know, one of the differences, I guess, between the sort, you know, Captain Cook's voyages and the sort of thing, you know, the Apollo astronauts uh, did and that John, you know, does, is that you have a team to help now. The, 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 the advent of remote communication means that you don't just have to rely on the people in your, you know, your little capsule. You can, you can ask for help. And that, that in a way, it changes human exploration forever, doesn't it? Because you, you don't have to be as self-reliant, maybe, but you still have to go through the whole emotion. It's still, you know, if you're there dealing with all this, it's still, 
you're the one that's going to deal with it but they just get to watch with popcorn almost <laughs> tea, you know, this this is how, how does it change things when adventures become a team thing rather than a you know lone here's a ship of people going over there any of you any, any of you got a contribution on the teams I mean, I think there's there's a there's a great sense of responsibility for the people who are back at home because they're not directly in danger, but they are responsible for these. In this case, three lives or however many people are in the the submersible, uh, they are very responsible for those people. And yes, the 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 advent of near instantaneous communication across the world is has been extraordinarily important in allowing various different forms of exploration to become plausible. John? In the deep ocean, the communication is still quite limited to these human occupied vehicles because we can't send useful radio waves um, down through seawater. Uh, it blocks them. So we can only use acoustic means of communication. So you have this thing called a sound powered telephone uh, to talk to the ship above, but it's, you know, it's not great. Uh, and you, you, you can't send live high definition video acoustically. Uh, the only way we do that now is, is, of course, for the deep ocean, we also have these remotely operated vehicles. So no people inside connected to the ship by a cable and we get live high definition pictures up that. We can then beam them by satellite around the world. Nowadays, I can sit at home and take part in a deep sea expedition, watching live images from the deep ocean and interacting with the team on the ship and sort of saying, you know, left a bit, left a bit. Can you pick up one of those for me or make a measurement of that over there? And, and that is very different. Um, and it feels like much more of, of a team effort. Uh, Does so it feel like you're cheating if you're doing that a bit. I mean, do you miss the? I guess it's a whole different experience. Do you, do you are you glad that you had the chance to go to go physically there before you started the remote exploration? It, it's an everlasting argument in my field between those who say human presence is still important uh, because you get a sense of the environment that it's hard to get through a TV screen and, and that kind of thing. And other folks say, do you know what, for the future, telepresence is the way to go. You know, we send our minds to the ocean floor. Our bodies can stay in, in comfort, even back home. Um, personally, I'm glad that this- a civilized life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Firstly, I'm, I'm glad that there is, the deep ocean is big enough, I think, for both kinds of technology. Um, so uh, you do, it is a different experience. Uh, that's very true. I, I think from actually having been there, I did get a perspective of the environments I've, I've you know, been trying to understand that, that it's hard to get with remote technology. In fact, I've been working on techniques to try and give you that same big overview that you get from picking your way across this landscape yourself, uh, which is harder to get from just seeing one TV image at a time, um, but it so can be done. When it comes to, ocean, you know, the physical oceanography that I do, I certainly am concerned that remote sensing, you know, instruments sending you numbers, they give you the impression that they're telling you everything. And if you're there, you can see the thing that you haven't thought to measure. But if you're completely reliant on what the machines are telling you, you have to assume you've got all the right machines. And I do worry about what that does to the way we observe our so environment. So way back in, in, in the days when scientists, this is, this is going way back to 19, oh, what are we talking, uh, 1957, there was a meeting of scientists in Washington DC to say, you know, these, these deep diving submersibles, are they going to be any use for science? And Alan Vine, who was the driving force be be behind the creation of the famous Alvin submersible that Woods Hole has operated for many de decades, and its name is a portmanteau of, of Al from Alan and Vin from Vine. He was at that meeting and he famously said, you know, a good instrument is great for measuring anything you want to understand, but I find it hard to imagine what instrument could have replaced Charles Darwin on the Beagle. <laughs> this ability to respond immediately. To that sort of and then part. the room just went quiet and he'd won. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest was history. <laughs> oh, great. We, just as a reminder to anyone who's joined us late, this is Ship, Sea and the Stars, the weekly online broadcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. This week, we're talking about journeys into the unknown, and we've got three fabulous contributors, uh, Greg Brown, Robert Blythe, and John Copley. And we're gonna move on now to our next object and the next theme really, which is that it's all very well going to weird and extreme places, but what do you find when you get there? And as an example of what you find when you get there, John has a genuine huff crab, which is very exciting. 
I do, I do. So I've actually got one, got one in my hand here. This is a small one. This is a new, well, it was new when we first saw it in 2010, species of crab from 2,000, two and a half thousand meters deep near Antarctica, living around hot springs on the ocean floor. And it was a complete surprise when we came across these on an expedition, uh, because normally you don't get crab-like animals in the deep ocean around Antarctica. They can't handle the cold um, down there. It's about it's about minus one and a half degrees where the in the waters where this lives. Although this is actually living like those monkeys on that island in Japan, basking in a, <laughs> in relative warmth near a hot spring, uh, which is how they survive. But it was a total surprise. We wouldn't we, have predicted. We didn't find one of them, right? The pictures oh. of these things are astonishing. Yeah, so, so piles, uh, <laughs> thousands upon thousands of them, basking in the warm water. Uh, they're called hoff crabs. That's a nickname from one of my former PhD students because they have hairy chests like <laughs> David <laughs> and uh, the, the hairs aren't to keep them warm because they're not warm blooded animals. Um, the hairs are basically they grow bacteria on their hairs. They garden bacteria on their hairs and they, they have comb like structures that they scrape off the bacteria and, and eat them. And, and the does the original grow. hoff do that too? Has anyone I, asked him? Who knows? <laughs> He's quite tickled at having this nickname after him. <laughs> Yeah. But it's, I mean, there's an interesting point here, isn't it, which is that, that, that really the deep sea is thought of as this kind of desolate, empty and certainly was, you know, it was almost thought there wasn't any point in going there because it was just, you know, nothing <laughs> like the vacuum of space. And yet there is there are lots of things down there. How uh, how much of it do we know about? How much is there still to discover? Well, we're discovering new species all the time um, on average, roughly. And this is a big global average and it does depend where you are in the world. You know, you come across an animal when someone did the sums a few years ago, you come across an animal when you're more than 3000 meters deep, which is still most of the deep ocean. There's about a 50 50 chance it might be something you haven't seen before. Um, now, it depends. Northeast Atlantic. We've been picking that over since 19th century uh, and less chance there. Deep Antarctic. My goodness. Yes. I mean, when we got to these hot springs down there, all the animal species we found thriving around them were new to science um, back in 2009, 2010. Uh, and, and so what, what's exciting for me about the deep sea is, is this idea of, of surprises, uh, because to get the funding for our research, we have to chase down what I would call, to borrow from Donald Rumsfeld, known unknowns. It's like the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, but we know what shape it is, you know, based on our understanding of how the ocean works and life in the oceans. This is what we expect to find if our hypothesis is correct. And we go out there to test our hypothesis. Um, and that's great. And that's how our understanding of how the oceans work develops. But in the deep ocean, what happens is you go out to do that. And that's what you have to do to, to get the funding. But always you're, you're looking out for and really hoping for the unknown unknowns, the things that you didn't realize you didn't know about or understand <laughs> that are often the real leaps forward in, in our understanding. So life at these hot springs on the ocean floor, as you say previously, you know, uh, back in the 19th century, a lot of scientists thought, oh, yeah, pretty lifeless in the deep ocean. Um, and that persisted for quite a while. That, OK, there's life down there, but it's pretty sparse. And then suddenly there are these amazing gardens of life down there because they're supported by a different kind of food chain that we, we didn't imagine was possible for animal life until these things were actually blundered across in terms of the animal life by accident back in the late 1970s. It's brilliant. I love it. And then the nice thing, of course, is that there are still things, even in our very con human controlled world, there are still things to discover. I like to move on to um, going back a bit in time and some unknown unknowns. Uh, Robert, you've got a picture to show us. Tell us tell us about what it is. So this is um, an oil painting by William Hodges, who was the artist with Cook on his second voyage to the Pacific. Um, both artists on the first voyage, unfortunately, um, died. But obviously, art is one of the few ways of creating a visual record of these new territories and people's landscapes that you are encountering. So here you've got the rather dramatic scene of Cook's ship, the um, Resolution, encountering a water spout. Um, and the ship is being almost driven onto the shore. Um, but what Hodges has done is that he's fallen back on his art training. So in the foreground, you've almost got a classical scene. So it's become a very strange hybrid image that's both art and meant to be a visual representation of what's been seen. 
And how how many of the things that because presumably the things that are most interesting to portray are the things that no one's seen before. So what sort of thing? I mean, was that was the water spout? Uh, what what would have been unusual in that image to someone at the time? What would have been the thing that they, oh I didn't know you were going to find one of those? Well, I I think for um for Hodges it just provides this additional sense of drama he's wanting to create something that's a sort of sublime image of of the south pacific and why not have the water spout in there as well so he's almost creating composite images that maybe relate to several different episodes that have been encountered whereas um the scientists the botanists on board etc they will be um preserving samples drawing botanical um representations that are much more accurate from a scientific point of view, whereas Hodges is actually giving a sense of the place that he's encountering. And was that, was that, I mean, I, I'd never really thought about that being a job, an artist who went along to, to, I guess, in the same way that the Antarctic expeditions took photographers, was it quite common for them to take artists to record what was seen? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and, Even and though they, some of them apparently didn't come home, you said two of them died, right? Two, two of them died on the first voyage, yeah. But um, and, and a naval officer would be trained to draw, but that's part of his surveying work. So they might draw a coastal profile so that you would recognise the, the coastline again, but they're not going to be able to get the sort of sense of the place that, that an artist would provide. So William Hodges was selected by the Admiralty to go out and be the visual artist for that voyage. And it's interesting this painting because it's got people in it as well who are presumably natives of that uh, of New Zealand on the shore, is that right? Well, you, <laughs> you, you presume so, but in point of fact, these are um, figures from a sort of classical history painting. Um, Hodges has gone back to his art school days, looked at ancient statuary and how figures are formed in history paintings, and he's filled the foreground with that. You've got to think Hodges wasn't on the shore watching Resolution. He's on Resolution. So this is, as I say, a composite an imagined image where he's put himself and the ship into a landscape. There's a really interesting um, sort of comparison there in the way that he's taking the familiar things in order to make the unfamiliar things seem real. Some, you know, there's some combining of the two to to make it part of our world, not just part of a completely different world. Yeah, I think artistically he's struggling with an entirely new landscape a new light i mean later artists who go to the pacific like gauguin you know the the colors that they infuse the paintings with are extraordinarily vivid and you know hodges is probably compensating with stronger colors more dramatic compositions in order to try and make sense of this bizarre new world that he's he's seeing and was there was there a big exhibition when he came back of all these images of the other side of the world? Was there much interest in that? Um, there's an interest in the images because, of course, the oil paintings are then engraved to become the illustrative prints for, for the voyage account. So lots of people will see um, Hodges' images, but of course they see them in black and white rather than in, in the sort of technicolour of, of the oil painting. And a lot of, I mean, it strikes me a lot of the, it's always struck me about these voyages of exploration that we talk about the getting there and the process of getting there, but actually what comes back, what you bring back, getting home, that's an important thing, but also bringing things back. And I guess these artworks are a way of bringing, sort of proving you were there almost. There's something about holding on to a relic or, you know, objects that prove it happened. Yes, so some of some of Hodge's paintings will have been shipboard paintings that he will have done, and then other ones will be composed from sketches that he's brought back, and then he'll work them up in his London studio. So, so they re they really are, you know, um, sort of captured moments that come together in in a single image. So on the Let's move on on the bringing things home uh, topic. So, Greg, you have some pictures to show us. Uh, tell us what these are. 
So uh, the good news, of course, uh, is that Apollo 13 did indeed make it home uh, with all of the astronauts intact. Uh, that's not to say that they didn't have yet more issues to deal with along the along the way. Um, of course, immediately when the the uh, uh, problem when the uh, explosion occurred it became a case of getting the astronauts home as quickly as possible and yet they were so far out that any attempt to immediately turn the uh, rocket around would just not have been feasible and indeed they were worried that the main rocket um, that powered the, the uh, this assembly uh, was damaged and by the original, original explosion so they decided to instead keep going and actually go loop the entire way around the moon and then come back and they actually became um, and still hold the record for the highest altitude altitude flight um, at 400 uh, 400,171 kilometers above the Earth's surface so they actually got further away than any other Apollo mission uh, has done since then um, and, and I think I read I heard an interview with Jim Lovell uh, on the on the excellent 13 minutes to the moon. And he was saying that if that oxygen tank had failed earlier in the mission, they wouldn't yes. have had enough power to get all the way around. And if it had failed later, they might already have been on the moon. And then, you know, you've got all these other problems. So so he yep. did say that if that almost the timing of the accident was critical, actually, in letting yep. them get back home. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because it occurred sort of in the middle part of the mission when they were relatively close to the moon, quite far away from the Earth, they didn't actually have to go as far in order to come back. They needed to loop around the moon relatively quickly and then come back to the Earth. Uh, even so, all of their supplies were very, very limited. Uh, the uh, oxygen wasn't too much of a problem. They did have enough when they moved into the lunar module. But the lunar module was only supposed to hold two people in it and only for about two days when they were on the surface of the moon. And yet they needed to get three people in there to last four days. Oxygen wasn't too much of an issue, but carbon dioxide was a massive issue. So they needed to make a filter that would be able to uh, get rid of this carbon dioxide, but the filters from the command module didn't fit the filters from the lunar module, so they needed to uh, bodge something together in order to make it work. Uh, water was required for coolant, but also for the, the astronauts to drink. They reduced their water intake to um, uh, 0.2 litres a day. Uh, one of them actually got uh, very ill because of the the lack of water. Uh, there were um, concerns that uh, the the smaller thruster on the lunar module would not be enough in order to be able to actually correct their course. There were all sorts of things that went that, that they had to try and deal with. But you're absolutely right. Had it occurred earlier, their water would have run out before they got back. Um, had they already landed on the moon and come back, the lunar module would no longer have the oxygen that was required in order to sustain them. So they would have died. They certainly would not have been able to make it back um, because the, the command module would have been unlivable and the lunar module would have had no air in it. So it was, strangely enough, a catalogue of terrible, massive failures within the spacecraft that all happened at exactly the right point to enable them to come back to the surface. Well, and it obviously made for a great movie as well. That's exactly, you know, you could have, that was the story. So maybe just finally from each of you, all of, you know, we're talking about getting into these extreme environments. Why is it important to do this? Why do people consistently push themselves to the point where they almost die or they might die and sometimes they do die? They build this incredibly expensive technology. They do these things that are frankly inconvenient and difficult and dangerous. What is important about this? What drives people to do this? Uh, it'd be great to get something from each of you on that. Uh, Robert, do you want to go first? We'll, well go in historical order here, so you can go first. Well, I mean, Cook is going out because they want to understand. They want to know what is on the other side of the world because they can't see the other side of the world, so they have to go there. And it, for him, it's the pursuit of useful knowledge. And he's bringing that back through charts and botanical samples and, you know, art and an understanding of of the people and places that he's encountered. And then that fits in to a bigger jigsaw and we begin to understand the modern world. 
So the drive for knowledge. Um, Greg, how about Apollo? Why did they do it? Well, part of it was the technical achievement. Uh, the ability to head into space had only been uh, it was only possible with the invention of the rocket, which occurred during the Second World War. So it was only in the 1950s and 1960s that people were first able to go out into space. Um, I will admit there was also a political reason. Of course, the United States of America and the USSR fighting against one another, not in an actual war in this particular case, but in the uh, trying to get the significant step of getting people onto the surface of the moon. But when it comes to science, which is the bit that I'm most interested in, there is certainly some some things that humans can do that robots can't or can't do anywhere near as fast. As it stands right now, we have uh, a rover on the surface of Mars called Curiosity. It's been there for uh, over half a decade at this point. Um, and it has traveled a grand total of a half marathon in all that time. It's done all sorts of wonderful work, but the lag time that it takes for a message to get from us to Mars and then get back again, means that moving this rover, taking this rover anywhere, trying to study anything on Mars or indeed any other part of our solar system or beyond is excru excruciatingly slow. If you placed, three astronauts on Mars for a week, they'd be able to do as much as Curiosity, possibly way more than Curiosity has managed to do in the last six, seven, eight years. So uh, crude uh, exploration of space is going to be extremely important going forwards. Although then you have to worry about bringing them back. Um, John, John, why do we do it today? Uh, I think for us in the deep ocean, it, it's still like Captain Cook. It, it's the pursuit of knowledge, um, but it's knowledge in two forms these days in the deep ocean. In part, it, it's pure knowledge. We go to these what to us are extreme environments because that expands our experience um, and the testing of our ideas about how our world works. We need to go beyond our everyday experience to, to check our, our ideas are right. It's kind of like Newtonian physics, so, you know, at everyday velocities works fine, but, you know, then when you, when you start going to incredible speeds, suddenly you need a different kind of physics. Uh, so it, it's very much for that. Uh, but these days, unfortunately, as well, it's because we're realising these aren't remote places to us. Our, our lives are having an effect down there through climate change, through pollution, through waste and so on. And we need to understand how that system works, what's going on down there to help people make better informed choices for the future. So it does, it, it matters that we understand where we live. That's brilliant. There's so much to talk about and we are out of time, which is a huge disappointment to me because there's so many interesting things to discover. Um, so we have come to the end of this episode. We'll be back every week uh, with new topics every week, lots of different curators and experts. Next week, we'll be talking about staying healthy while in isolated and extreme places, uh, about mental and physical health and some of the entertainment and creativity that people uh, kept themselves sane with in these environments. Uh, if there's a question on any of these topics that you'd like answered, please do let us know. Look for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. And although the buildings are closed, the museum is still there. The collections are still there. And if you go to rng.co.uk, you can see a huge range of things. Uh, there are activities, online activities coming up. There's museum from home. There's lots of things going on. So do go to the website and look, and what, look at what's going on there. Um, I... Oh, enormous thanks to our brilliant three contributors today, uh, Greg Brown, Robert Blythe and John Copley. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next week and thank you for watching. <laughs>